Hey guys, Kyle Miller, auto mortgage agent with Mortgage Brokers Ottawa. Uh, back in the saddle on this recording stuff like I used to do because the information is fun and talking is fun. Um, I have two guests with me today, Michelle and Marilyn Scribnock, real estate agents here in Ottawa. Uh, and they're partners of mine who've done business together and wanted to have a discussion today because uh, it's the topic for the month about um, actually separations. Huge bummer. But, I mean, it happens, apparently 55% or more of the time, unfortunately. So, wanted to have a discussion about that and how it affects things in terms of real estate, in terms of financing, and get your ladies' take on it uh, for those reasons as well. And have a chat about what you see, what I see, how we help each other, how we work through it, and give some information to the public. So, thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Um, Thanks for today. asking us to join you. It's great. Yeah, it's great to talk about what could be a bummer topic, but it's well, information. It's, actually, that... it's great to talk about it because it's such an important topic to discuss and so many people have no clue what happens next. So I think it is a good topic, even though it's a bummer of a topic. Yeah, and I think that's the interesting thing is that we got onto this because of you know mutual clients and talking through it and just people's thoughts are just so they just they just don't know they don't know what they don't know about it it's in what in their head it's just this is going to be easy and we're out and it's unfortunate but let's move on when it's just not that simple right i think also the rules have changed and you know i think it was easier to just kind of get out and walk away whereas i think now uh the way the courts are handling separations divorces is is a lot different yeah. And I've never been through it. So I don't, I don't know. I, I totally speak from the finance perspective and what I see, not so much like, Oh yeah, it happened to me. Um, so it, which I'm glad, but it's, yeah, that's definitely a different, uh, it's definitely a different kettle of fish now. How, so to, to start it off, how do you like, do you ladies run into this a lot? Is it something you're seeing like that you can honestly just say, yeah, this is happening more. Happening more and more. Yes. Yeah. And the first question we always get is, what do we do now? I want to buy a house. We're splitting up, but I want to go buy my own house. And it's, it just, you can't like, there's so many steps. So just educating on the steps as to what you need to do before you can start looking for a house, because it's really super important to be pre-qualified before you can even shop in a normal situation. So to throw in divorce and separation into all that and making sure that you have your paperwork all done. So there's no sense even going until you have a separation agreement signed and sealed between the two partners. Well, and for most people, we meet them that I would say a year to a year and a half before they actually can sell. They don't realize it's going to take that long. They just call because they want to know the value of their home. And I'm like, where are you in the process? And they're like, we're just separating. And you're like, it's going to be a bit. <laughs> and you just stay in contact. Yeah. And I think that's the, that is the big thing is people, people wish it to be just right. We've made the decision. It's done. Let's go. And I think that it stems back to a lot of financing stuff where, uh, especially nowadays, like Marilyn, you're saying with, you know, the, just the, the rules, right? There's so much paper in what we do, whether people well, want to it, uh, admit it or not. There's a ton of paper. Everything is tracked because, you know, somebody somewhere was dishonest and not nice and the bank got screwed. So the bank's like, oh, fool me once. Right. And now all the rules have changed. So people don't understand the implications of buying a house while still owning another house or, you know, having your ex spouse potentially able to come after you for that house that you bought, well, even though you're yeah. gone, you know, you're not together. Right. And because somebody did that sometime. Yeah. Right. And that's the tough part. Now, have you seen any additional challenges? We'll come back to that separation agreement, but have you seen any additional challenges specifically in our market, like with how hot it is, how fast things move, has that, is that a different layer that you ladies are seeing? Well, well there's yes. many layers before that one, right? Yeah. It's yeah. Many, many layers happen before that. Mm -hmm. People tend to think they can just buy the other spouse out and not realize they have to qualify for all of that on their own. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that itself needs explanation and probably the whole 
podcast in itself is just yeah. my <laughs> spouse. Like literally, that's that's probably a whole a whole uh, episode on its own. Just because you're, it, it's not a cookie cutter situation. It's not like here you do A, B, C. It that involves people. People involve motion. Motion involves uh, illogical actions. <laughs> Yeah. Which then makes things go longer and makes things go into litigation and litigation causes money. And then the money that you started with that you thought you had slowly goes and goes and goes as well. And then of course you're, you have to live between A and B of decision when you started to, when you can actually do it. And that costs you money as well, because then you're going into rentals. So a lot of the times these simple, well, simple, that's not the best word to use. A lot of the time the, so the, solution is rent for a year correct your financial situation keep us in the loop while we're talking to you during that year uh, work on your financial situation get things going and then uh, when you're you know keep in contact with your mortgage broker and when the mortgage broker gives you green lights that gives us green light but before your mortgage broker gives you green light we don't really want to like it, we can't do anything for you. We can find you your dream house just for you to go, Oh, I can't get it. Yeah. And I think, yeah. So if there's, if there's advice to give there, and obviously this is for everybody watching and then for you ladies to take with you as well too. But the, the big thing to a couple of big things to understand from the finance side of things is there's, there is actually two ways to get money, if you will, out of the house to buy that spouse out. If that was one direction, right? Obviously sell the house, everybody splits stuff. That's an answer. If someone wants to keep the house, which we have seen in a lot of cases too, because buying in peak is tough. There's two things to understand. So the one is that when you're doing a refinance, the maximum amount of money you can refinance to is 80% of the value of the house. And that means something because if you owe your spouse, not, I don't say, owe. if you have to split a ton of money, not only do you a have to qualify for it, you it has to fit under that 80% number. So when you go to someone and that's good for them to know, because when you say, yeah, your house is worth five. Okay, good. And they can do their math. Someone has to be able to say, well, what's 80% of five and start using that number because refinancing is one, is one solution. What most people don't realize is that the, the default insurers will forget about that for a sec, but there is a program available for a spouse to actually buy another spouse out where you can get up to 95% of the value of the home. Right. So, if, so that's one way to push past that 80% mark and not be forced to sell the house. We can always go down the road of second mortgages and stuff like that, but that's not fun or part of this conversation. So, so that's two things. That product. Sorry. Who, who actually has that product? Is it is pretty, through brokerage or is it through banks as well? Um, it, it should, it's available for anybody who wants to do it and subscribes to CMHC. So that's, sorry, the long answer is both. <laughs> yeah, both. Brokers, <laughs> banks can do it. Um, I don't, I feel like the broker, the broker channel probably does it more because it's something, it's not niche. It's just, we play in that stuff a little bit more. Cause it's not as, it's not as common, but that's where our knowledge base lies is for stuff a little bit outside the box. Um, so it's totally doable through in the majority of lenders that touch um, and deal with CMHC or some of the other insurers. Now, not to go off on a tangent, but the main thing, and it comes back to what you'd said before, step one is getting the separation agreement done, which is, which is the toughest part because you're doing that while still potentially living with the person you're not wanting to live with anymore. So that's the first thing because no matter what you do, when money transfers hands and when there's real estate involved, they have to know, like the banks have to know how this stuff is flu is, is moving. Cause if so, they don't, if they don't, it gets very messy and very difficult. So to address that separation agreement, mm -hmm. there's some guidelines that the a good thing would be to have a uh, conference, like a counseling session or a conference session with your lawyer, because there's things you should and shouldn't do that affects that separation the easiness of how that separation thing the agreement goes. So, like, don't move money. <laughs> like, don't. Is your partner by, yeah. by 
by moving money and, and trying to sell off or hide things or whatever. Like first thing you should do is take pictures and know exactly where the debts go and where the assets are and then get all that stuff in a row and be able to discuss them. And if you could, you know, peacefully decide on, on where they're going and get that separation agreement uh, on paper quickly, then you're golden because it just comes down to basically getting that piece of paper and, and deciding and who gets what. So if you can get your assets and get your debts on paper, divide them out and know who gets what, that piece of paper can be signed very quickly. So it doesn't necessarily have to take years. And that's something that's very important. And it's usually uh, the attitudes or the harsh hurt feelings that causes the long years. In well, there's always an injured party, right? <laughs> yeah, rare, yeah rarely, rarely is it super, rarely is it super split. Like I have friends of mine who went through this and just their relationship was, it's not that it was a bad relationship. It's just the way they, the way they did stuff was they made literally the same money ish like to win it in a couple grand and the costs at the time worked out the mortgage covered you know he could cover the mortgage she could cover the bills and for the most part it was pretty equal uh their own credit their own vehicles their own investments so when it came down to them deciding okay we're done it was who's keeping the house you owe me this much money what's happening with our son um i have mine you have yours like it was it was as picture perfect, that sounds terrible to say, as picture perfect as a separation as could go as possible. Yeah. Cause, and I'm not suggesting by any means that everybody just lives separate lives and, you know, domestic partnership over love. I'm just saying I'm not a relationship guy or doctor, I should say, but it's, um, but that's the way it, it, people want it to work. But as soon as you start messing with, let's say messing, mingling things together, that's when it gets, that's when it gets gnarly. Cause from the bank standpoint, what they're looking for, what they basically need to know is what's happening with the house because they don't want to get caught in a battle between you and the ex on the house. That has to be split. They need to know what's happening with the debts and who owes what because when you go out to buy your own and you're still stuck with the other person's stuff, that's your responsibility. No, there is no, there is no, 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 that's his or that's hers. If your name's on it, dude, it's yours. Mm -hmm. like it or not right so that's just you said it has to be written in there and then thirdly it becomes you know kids and support if there's children and someone's paying for the child that's a debt for that person right i think one of the myths too is that women get more money and that's not necessarily how that works Uh, one of the things that people don't realize is that they have to qualify on their own and what that means because when you've been married for a long time and all your stuff is mingled like that you just think in your head oh my credit score is this and oh my we can afford that and but it's no longer a we and our it's what can my salary and my debt score and my credit score now buy and purchase me because a single family income you cannot buy your $600,000 home anymore. Well, and I think the detriment of the markets you asked like this market is before you could divorce in this city when housing prices were four years ago and you get a town home for 380. Now townhomes are six to $700,000. You are even to buy a condo, you're looking at a, a four or 450, they become harder and harder to purchase 100%. on your own. And, and I know, I know someone, not someone, it's someone's situation is going to be okay. Well, I'm receiving support, right. As part of this settlement agreement, which is fine. And you can use that as part of your, you can use that as part of your, uh, as part of your income, right. As qualifying income, which is, which is great. But again, it's that there's a lot in the, in the divorces I've dealt with or separations I've dealt with. There's a lot of, well, it's gonna, right? It's gonna be this. And until it's on paper, and specifically for those, um, for the support payments, we need three months proof it's going into the bank, right? I so then three months proof of gonna, gonna is happening. 
yeah, yeah, exactly. That situation, the Gona, right? And they had the separation agreement, but she was being nice to her husband when he was late. Except when we went to qualify for the mortgage, the bank's like, I need to see three months consistent payments. Stop being nice. Yeah. yeah. And that's and that's exactly it. It's the it's again, that's another case of people being, you know, nice or not being dishonest, just doing what they're okay with and hoping the bank's going to agree. Right. And it's, it's just not, this is clear cut and dry stuff. Like it is black and white, right? Yeah. Just because you're a nice person, no offense. It doesn't mean anything. No. It sounds terrible, but it's kind of true, right? And you have to do it by the book, right? Once you're in the house, be as nice as you want. You want to let so-and-so pay you late. Well, whatever, but to get in, it's got to be by the book. And that's, mm-hmm. Again, I think, like you said, it's a huge misconception about what people hope is reality versus what it is, right? And the other thing, too, is heading back on there is like, if one person, it doesn't matter which partner it is, that is making more money, they might be the one having to pay the spousal support. And it, it doesn't matter if it's male or female, it, it doesn't like the payment let's say one is making only forty six thousand a year and the other is making 150 well the 150 dollar person is going to be somehow responsible for that other person when they split stuff up so that that also again that person that's sitting at the forty six thousand dollar rate you're not qualifying for a house <laughs> It's, it's you no longer can live in a house your life situation is not it's changed not just because you're separated your life change is that you are now your lifestyle is changing yeah even a rental sure. you can't get a rental at that either yeah yeah it's it's definitely something people have to can to have to consider and i'm not saying live in an unhappy it's just and but Michelle it's really understanding about rentals now michelle speak a little more about how it is to qualify for a rental it's actually harder to qualify for a rental than it is to get a mortgage they how's they, that we do more paperwork and they require more paperwork from us to get a rental than it does to get a mortgage really not yeah. Yeah. And yeah. i'm not i'm not even playing <laughs> like i've never done it i have no i just right yep we have to provide a credit check Letters of employment, three months of pay stub or three last pay stubs, and then the landlord gets to decide whether he's satisfied or not. Even if your credit score is through the roof, if they look and they go, "Well, rent is two thousand and you make sixteen hundred, how are you going to pay your bills and your car payment?" And they go, "No, we want to wait for somebody that's retired or older." Or happens all the time. We have great people that we can't even get in rentals because the tenants, landlords don't want to be stuck, right? Well, I mean, and that's, I mean, it's, it sucks, but it's fair, right? Why yeah. you can't, yeah. we're gonna, why, it's, it's similar to the bank saying, you know, they, someone says, well, I know my qualification is this, but I already pay this. And the bank should be able to see that. They're not gonna, they're not gonna uh, willingly put someone into a default position right? Yeah. It costs a lot of money to take a house back from somebody. So they're not going to do it just because, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. And coming back to something else that we were mentioning before, when it comes to the support payments, there's a couple of things that happen there too, from a finance standpoint, the banks, the, the qualification, they look at uh, uh, child support payments as that's a debt. That's owning a car. It's the mm-hmm. same impact as that. So the higher that disparity between the two parties or uh, the income or um, just th- that payment, that could sink you as an individual just like that, right? So it's something, it's something to be very cognizant and wary about because it's not, it's not simple. And interesting things I've seen is where, and I don't know these implications, so you have to talk to the tax guys. But for the tax guys out there, when you suggest to those two parties, hey, like I've seen it where, you know, for example, she, he was paying her 600 bucks and she was turning around and paying him 250, right? Because so net effect of whatever that math is, 350, right? And ending up in her pocket. 
And they were doing that from a tax perspective, right? Well, when we go to qualify their mortgage and stuff, they both have support payments. And they call, they look at me and they're like, no, 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 Kyle, you don't understand. I'm like, I don't have to understand. That's what the paper says. <laughs> I don't even care what it is. It's just there. So now you both have these extra payments and less income coming in. And yes, there's support, blah, 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 but it just messes everything up. So it's, and I, there's no solution there. I'm just saying like, you're not smarter than the system and you really want to talk to the you ladies and the me's and the accountants to figure out how it's all going to work together because yeah. we end up, we end up just working against each other. Right. Yeah. So the other so question, Kyle, is what for uh, financing, qualifying for a mortgage, what is the biggest debt? Uh, like what should you not have? Like if you had to pay something off, would you pay off your credit card or your car? Like this is a common question. Like, yeah. Just... From a straight qualifying perspective, the, the two things that drive a successful mortgage application are income and debt payments, right? So, so your any loan is a set loan. If you pay more on the loan, your payment doesn't go down. That's why it's, that's why it's, it's always best to get rid of a car, right? Cars kill deals. I should have a shirt, but cars kill deals, right? And I know everybody needs one, whatever. I'm just saying, choose wisely because it will affect what you do, right? And then the next thing after that is unsecured debt, credit cards, lines of credit. That's basically it. Credit cards and lines of credit. <laughs> we have to, your payment in reality is what? 1% or something silly on the balance, right? Pays nothing down, but it, you can service the debt. That's fine. We can't use that. We have to use 3% of the balance. So your $10,000 credit card that you just took on for your ex-spouse as part of the deal, fine, right? That's not a $50 a month payment to me. That's a $300 a month payment. You just bought another car, <laughs> but I didn't Kyle. I know you didn't. They think you did and they're going to make us calculate it that way. So mm -hmm. income, debt payments, those are the two big things, right? That's the main thing to always look at. And again, it's a manipulation of, okay, I'm getting this big payout or not big. I'm just getting money from this. If I'm that side of the equation, I'm getting money from this. What should I do with it? That's part of the talk of all three of all three of us, right? Is what do we do? So what is it if they have, uh, let's say a student loan, a car payment, uh, what, what are you going to, or in a credit card, what are they going to pay down first? Uh, anything that has anything that equates to the highest payment, in my opinion. So right? the highest so, interest rate? No, no. And that's the interesting thing. No, financial planners are going to hate this part. But in the, in, the, in the interest of buying the house, it's what equates to the biggest payment. So if we just keep it simple, you get $10,000 on a car loan, you got $10,000 on a credit card, you got $10,000 on a student loan, right? The student loan is probably 150 bucks a month. It'd be the cheapest payment, right? Uh, the, car, the, the, the line of credit or credit card, whatever I said, that's going to have a $300 a month payment on my side. Whether it's true or not, doesn't matter. That's what it's going to be. And the car payment's 500 bucks. Pay the car. Because that's going to open up $500 in buying power instantaneously for you, right? So that's how I always look at it. That's how probably most good brokers look at it too, to manipulate that. You may not like it because it's 0%. <laughs> but it's not about the interest rate. It's 100% about the payment. Right. So you start doing that. Uh, the support income maybe, and then you can, you start to manipulate that in the most legal way possible to make it work, to make the numbers work for you. Well, another question. That's a whole other conversation because it's not 0% interest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Financial <laughs> planners out there are just, <laughs> financial planners just like, oh my God, they hate this. But who are these the people? Point though, Michelle, it's not 0%, even though they but say. But you're right. It's oh, all yeah, you're right. into the payment. It's there. Yeah, They're making the money. <laughs> You know what never happens? The house never loses. <laughs> the house never loses. Banks don't lose. Finance companies don't lose. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. For sure. But that's uh yeah, that's a big that's the big part. Now, what about what about for you ladies in terms of 
like you don't just walk in and then say like or how do you handle that with your clients especially when they're especially when they're like we're in the throws here there's two of them sitting across the table from you and they both they know they want out right like how does how does that how does that go i don't like yeah. i only end up talking i only talk to one usually so well, a lot of times I only talk to one too. I it's rare you get both together unless you're signing paperwork. I've agreed to the agent of choice because they do that too. So yeah. usually it's only one I'm talking to, and it's it's usually very early when I've when I've met the people we've met. The ones that I've met have been, like I said, very, very early. And then we just keep nurturing and helping and supporting that relationship along till it's time to meet the two of them together. And what about now? What are what are the considerations that you're? Oh, I get to answer. <laughs> I get to What's answer that? the same question. <laughs> oh, okay, go. Yeah, go. Um, what when you're meeting them? The first thing I always ask is like, have you spoken to like a mortgage broker or your bank yet to know where where you are in your finances? And then. Um, you know what like michelle said though is it depends on where they are on the road like it has to be like are you at the end where you've already agreed and you're actually out or are you just sitting in the house and you're talking about separating and then you know where are you on the road but let's let's put them at the end where they're out and they're going on their own and now they have to find housing for themselves or them and their kids or whatever they are then at that point if everything is signed and out I bounce them to a mortgage broker right away because I can't or we can't do anything for them until we know exactly where their budget is. So we, we start at the budget conversation, where you are in your finances and what can you afford? Because it does two things. It makes them go through and have a conversation with somebody like yourself uh, that then makes the reality of I only have one income and my now financial situation is this versus in their mindset of habitual mindset of this is what I can buy. This is what I can do. So that kind of gives the third parties advice in there, which helps us. <laughs> build a relationship with them without being like you can't afford that <laughs> we make you say that <laughs> yeah, yeah. People still don't yeah. understand how much the rules have changed whether they're divorced or not they're like oh i got approved before i'll do it again i'm like whoa whoa <laughs> yeah. whole new world no <laughs> yeah oh it's and i think it's even i i it's even tougher uh with like the older people are mm -hmm. right like if you've you know, I had, a, I had a client, she was married for 25 or 30 years, right? And is, is buying her first house, just closed last week, uh, buying her first house on her own, right? And and I'm not gonna lie, like there was, there was tears on the phone the odd time because I have to, I'm asking those questions like, okay, I saw that there was, a, you know, another person on this house a couple of years ago that you sold and that's where your money came from. Like, I need the separation agreement. I need the divorce agreement. Right. And it was, it's tough. So I think, I think, and that's the thing is even discussing yeah. that with her, she's on a fixed income now, but I have all this and that. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's yeah. how much money do you make today at today's rules? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really getting reacquainted with that, which I find is, is a part of the process and we do it and we love to do it, but that's tough on some people. Building the relationship on like from Michelle and I's side is supportive to what you have to do on your side because Huge. when you guys speak, like when you speak to somebody, you it, it has to be difficult. And then we get to kind of like um, nurture that through for them with you know, helping them to understand what you kind of just said to them and then putting it into reality of, you know, searches and looking at now, uh, you know, if they came out of a $800,000, $900,000 house and now they're looking at a four hundred dollars or $500,000 house, well, we have to adjust their mindset to this new lifestyle as well, right? So we do a lot of counseling as far as it goes just in, I mean, Michelle, about lifestyle change and just what what's your house going to look like now in what you can and can't have you may not get that in ground pool you may not get like 
<laughs> you know, where you live, the, the place in the city where you live, like a lot of that counseling kind of thing comes into play. And they always go back. I had, I had, but we don't have that now. This is what we're working with. And I, I understand you had a 3000 square foot home with an in-ground pool, but reality is that's not what we're looking for. Yeah. 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 And that's, yeah, I, I was, that was another question I had too was, you know, how does that, what is that? You kind of already answered it, but like, what does that look like of just, you know, trying to, trying to get someone into that, into that mind frame of this is where we are now, right? Kyle gave you the number or your broker gave you the number and that number equates to this. And this either has to work or is what works, or yeah. I don't know what the next option is. <laughs> well, that, that, that's where we have end up having a lot of conversations just on, uh, but I found this house in Rockcliffe Park that I want to go see. Well, and we have your approval letter at, <laughs> so let's go look over here and, you know, yeah. just, shifting a mindset and, and lifestyle is is really hard and it take it could take up to 10 showings before they can even shift well, hopefully not that many but it can eh, Michelle? Some, it just depends right how how easy they are to shift because it can be hard to let go of what you had and now what you're going to have to that new that new lifestyle is it's scary yeah, yeah. i think too it's um uh again finance side of things uh, with the way the market is price wise and whatnot i think the realization too is that there's there's going to need to be more help from you know whether it's other family members or even just you know still and i know it's a kick in the like ugh, to ask for a co-signer at 40 50 some odd years old right but like I said, the income, the income needed drives the deal so much. Uh oh, go ahead. Question. You used a word that I hate, and I'm sorry. You can clarify on your side, co-signer. Okay. I'm not sure. Like, okay, you correct me if I'm wrong. Is it not better as the person who's be the co-signee to gift or donate money to a person in need than it is to co-sign for somebody in need because you get stuck in your credit as the co-signee it sucks until they get off it's like really difficult for the person who then co-signed and it is hard on your credit to purchase a car a house or anything you want to do in your life that you worked hard to go forward on so co-signing for somebody I'm not sure if I agree with you. <laughs> oh, I'm not. Uh, it's a huge risk. I'm sorry. It is. <laughs> oh no! Don't get don't get me wrong. I wasn't saying that's just the that's just the like the solution. I, it it is a solution. And again, I don't think there's a wrong answer to to either side of that, right? For some people, co-signing is no big deal. And if you're the right finance person, I'll say bank broker it doesn't matter. You will talk that person through what they're signing up for, right? They're still coming back to what I commented before. There's still people who think, well, it's theirs. I'm just, I'm just helping, but it's theirs. It's not my problem. It's just because I say this, dude, it's your problem. You're 70, you're 90, you're 40. It's your problem. So to your point, I completely agree that yes, you might just say, you know what? Here's some cash, right? So, so that's, it's definitely, it's two different things completely. I don't think either one of them are bad at the same point. Cash is also a finite resource, right? So, so to put someone's salary, even if it's their pension salary or CPP or OAS, right? Adding that to someone's qualification is, is easier than maybe that person trying to find the required 50, 100, 120, like how much money is enough, right? So I think it comes down to that. I, I Again, I don't disagree with you. I'm not even arguing. I'm off a path, just, but at the same time, that's a whole counseling issue because oh, they, yeah. they say, how much are you going to make somebody else pay for your mistakes? Because it's a huge price tag to ask yep. someone to sign and, and take on them that way so yeah it's it just it has to be explained that, properly. 
we'll leave it at that and keep going because <laughs> you want to. Yeah, go. oh, it's it's a total other it's a total other talk, but yeah. I agree. I don't disagree. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing people don't realize, because they are having to requalify at lower price points, and most of those are condos now. So when we get them, are like, did you tell your broker you're looking at condos? Because those condo fees are factored in to your approval. Oh, yeah. And they and don't realize that. They just think, yes, I'm good to go. And I'm like, no, no, you need to tell them you're now looking at condos. This is an important conversation with your broker. Yeah, for sure. Um and it, it does need to happen. And again, I'm, I hope I'm going to say hope here, right? If someone, if, if I'm looking at a file and I see the numbers, I can figure out pretty quick where this is going. And because I do deals, I know what the price points in Ottawa are. So I know this is going to be a condo, right? My question becomes not if it's, where is it? And how much are the fees? Not, Oh, I wonder if, right. It's that's it. Unless you're telling me I'm going to, you know, Chenny, well, okay, then fine. 250 grand might get you what you need out there. Maybe not anymore, but, um, but yeah, I, yeah. You have to be able to recognize that. The other day that was like really, really bad. It was at 350. I was like, what? <laughs> that, again, that's another conversation about what's going on, but yeah, I think hopefully the person recognizes that because I, yeah. I'll speak for my industry and say recognize that so another thing to bring up in qualifying and splitting up and uh it's, it's going into mobile parks you have to pay cash you can't finance those to say that again to what mobile a mobile park so we have a oh, lot of fees yeah. i just sold one they don't realize they have to be an all cash deal literally yep. all cash <laughs> there are a few real slim options honestly they're just few and far between and they're very specific and um like a couple credit unions will consider them some branches will consider them but you can't but i will say this you cannot rely on that i would i would wholeheartedly say that's what you're doing is buy, buy cash and a lot if you're looking at purchasing a lot you're not getting oh. financing builds yeah again not without 50 percent down right like there's again there's always ways to get money but it's like do you wanna and it doesn't mean it's it doesn't mean it's cheap so as much as there's options you have to be you have to know those options so and again i think yeah yeah, it's got to fit with what you have so yeah it's got to come it all comes back to that whole organization and just like you know working through, working through the system. So if so let's do this, we can wrap this up a little bit, but what would be three things you would tell people in this situation to do if it was from your side? I say your side being the real estate side. I'll, I'll go first. That way I get my three out of the way first and you can go second, Michelle. <laughs> you can just save them all. <laughs> we might just I'm agree. Have three new ones. <laughs> <laughs> I would say talk to your mortgage broker or your bank first because we need a budget oh actually i'm gonna erase that out of my order number ah see yeah i gotta call myself before i call myself <laughs> number one have your separation agreement signed if it's not signed get it organized number one number two talk to your mortgage financial person and then know what your budget is and then number three we can start shopping into your budget point that you've been appointed to once everything is settled and done. So tag your at Michelle, try to find three new ones. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I'd say, like, it's one thing to talk about the budget, but they also have to talk about the house, like the price of the house they're in and, and what they're going to do with that. Because before you can shop, you probably are going to have to sell unless you're buying the other person out and then start shopping. Yeah. So because unless you know where your down payment's coming from, and have it ready it's you need to know the price of your house and start selling yeah i do have yeah actually was we didn't even none of us brought that up yet but the deposit you can speak more on this michelle because it was your point the deposit and down payment speak more on that so when i when i when we talk to buyers we generally tell them the cost of purchasing because when i talk to people even regular buyers and this isn't just divorcees I ask them, do you know what it's going to cost you to move the upfront costs of moving? And they say, no, I just, and I'm like, 
there is an upfront cost. You need your down payment. It has to be in the bank for 90 days. The bank has to see it sitting there or you get the money, whatever is coming to you. You need um, to know you, all your closing costs, usually around 17 to 1900 for the lawyer and that's title and everything. And then your inspections, you need to have $1,500 set aside for those as well. Plus your deposit needs to be sitting somewhere you can have it in 24 hours once you make the offer and it's accepted. And they're like, what? Most people don't know that. They don't realize, they just think I'm buying a house. That's all they think. Yeah, because that's what they did the first time. Yeah, they don't realize all the costs that they need. You should have ten to fifteen thousand yeah. dollars sitting somewhere in a bank already. Yeah. Liquid cash, liquid cash, accessible, not just sitting in a bank in an RSRP or something. It has to be liquid, accessible cash. Very important. I'll say, <laughs> I'll say three things actually, because uh, it all wrapped up together. Uh, one, don't think you can use your line of credit because that affects your credit stuff and how much so don't fall back on that because you can't i it's mean there's like always cash. ways but it's not liquid cash uh two rsps now can be used for down payment even if you've done the first time home buyer uh plan once you can use it again when it comes to a relationship breakdown so not a bonus that there's a breakdown bonus that you can touch those again so that's something to know um and three yeah i'd say there's only one thing I need and it's the separation agreement. Everything else will fall into place. Everything will fall into place off that piece of paper. It's people don't realize that it takes about 72 hours to get their RSP money. Yeah, so I'll, I, I'll work on that, but yes, you're right. But for the deposit, it's important mm. that because people have said, oh, I've just put in the application to get my money. And you're like, what? The yeah. offer says, and I said 24 hours after. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 72 hours later. <laughs> oh yeah, details. What about those? Yeah. 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 We're important. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. A little bit. But that's what we're here to do. We're here to help people out through that stuff. So that's what we do. But I but think uh, I think to talk through and summarize everything we said. And um because it's very important, it's one thing to tell people everything we just said. Because when you're in an emotional state, you don't capture or absorb all of the details that we just went through. Like there are so many details that we just talked about that you that you need to have all lined up before you can buy. So it's really important to have them written out for people to and to go through it and have it sent through so you can have the conversation and then email it to them because, oh my goodness, there's they'll be like, what? I never knew that. And you're like, Ugh. yeah. <laughs> And it's, it's, yeah, like it's people don't know what they don't know. And that's what we're here to do. Right. So I, yeah, put it in front of them for sure. Yeah. For well, sure. from Marilyn and Michelle, the Scrimnock team at Keller Williams, we appreciate you asking us all these questions. Well, it's good. I, that's, I love the conversations. It's stuff we talk about amongst us and other brokers, me and other brokers all the time. And it's stuff we've had conversations with over the phone. So like I said, the one we were talking about yesterday, could have just recorded that phone call. Here, listen to this, people. <laughs> It'll work. But no, this yeah, has been great. When we use names, we're not allowed to. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, it's true. Can't do that. Can't do that. Awesome. Well, this has been great. And we will uh, we'll push it. And yeah, this has been great. Really appreciate you ladies giving us the time. And um, yeah, hopefully someone will take something from this. And yeah. if anybody's got any questions, they can reach out. All our information will be at the bottom. Give us a call, have a chat, and we'll help you through whatever you're going through. Thanks very much, ladies. Be, it would be great too to see some follow up on this. If um, we could do another one on a topic that uh, coincides with this, if people have additional questions, just let us know. Yeah, we'll take that. We'll take whatever suggestions and run with it for sure. Thanks, Kyle. Have a great day. Thanks, ladies. Bye. Have a good afternoon.